Hello again. Uh, my name is Masood Olia, and I'm back again, uh, this time with a problem on combined loading. So this is basically where everything that uh, in a simple, uh, you know, mechanics of material course that you take, you know, basic mechanics of material course that you take, they all come together from axial load to uh, uh, torsional load to uh, bending to uh, transverse load and so on. Okay, so what we have here, we have a solid shaft which uh, has certain diameter. Let me tell you what the diameter of this shaft is. The diameter of this shaft is uh, 50 millimeters. So I forgot to put the diameter here. So 50 millimeter diameter. As you could see, this is subjected to uh, bunch of loads here. So you have this kind of like a shear load, uh, 30 kilonewton parallel to the y-axis here. Then you have a, an axial load of 80 kilonewton, which is compressing, you know, this whole uh, shaft. And then, of course, a torsional uh, load, a twisting moment. This is moment about z-axis, which we call it a torque of 4 kilonewton meters. Okay, so the objective is at a certain section of this shaft, this solid shaft, we want to, uh, which is 100 millimeters below the top, we want to look at two points, point H and K. And the objective, as you can see here, is to find normal and shear stresses at point H and K. Once I calculate these shear stress, um, normal and shear stresses for you, then I'm going to show, you know, these stresses on a stress element at point H and K. So what normally you have to do is to figure out what are the internal forces at this location at the location of the interest. Now I have to tell you that actually this particular section is not the most stressed section or the most critical section of the, the shaft, but rather where the base is, where this moment of this force is going to be uh, maximum. So what I did here, I put together um, just a diagram of just this section. So if we cut this section and show what forces are forces and moment are here. So we have obviously the internal, uh, we, we have the uh, normal force due to that 80 kilonewton internally at this section. We also have this shear force which we transfer it here. So that would be a shear force in the Y, along the Y axis pointing in the negative Y direction. And of course this twisting moment which is four kilonewton meters is gonna be here as well. But look, once you transfer this load to this section, the, you have to consider the moment of this load about this section. And as you could see, that generates moment about x-axis here. And that moment would be simply, and I have it written it here, 30 kilonewton times 0.1. So this is 30,000. When you multiply it by 0.1 meter, 100 millimeters, you end up getting 3,000 newton meter. And look, look at the way this is acting. So what this does, it puts point K in tension, and if you were looking at a point right here, it would be in compression. But look at the effect of this guy on point H. H happens to be on the x-axis, and since this is the moment about the x-axis, actually H is right on the neutral axis, so there is no stress due to that moment. Uh, so this is the 3,000 here, newtons meters. Okay. We are ready to go ahead and calculate the normal stresses, and after that, we calculate the uh, shear stresses. So I'll start with sigma at H. So sigma at H, all the points actually on this uh, cylinder and this section, due to this normal force, are going to be compressed. So don't look at just this center point and say, oh, the, the 80 kilonewton is going to just affect this center point. Imagine if this uh, cylinder is capped and you're applying a load uniformly to it. So every point on this cylinder is going to be compressed. So therefore we have a compressive stress equal to my N over A, a cross-sectional area, and that's negative. Now a minute ago we said that the moment about x-axis is not going to have any effects for point H. Therefore the MC over I No effect for H. But look, for K, what, what happens? Well, first of all, we have, due to axial load, we have the, um, the compressive stress due to this 80 kilonewton. But look what happens to H. As you apply this 
moment about the x-axis, point k is going to be in tension. Therefore, we add this mxc divided by ix. You know, we have to get to the habit of matching you know, the moment of inertia, the, the subscript of moment of inertia with the subscripts of, of the moment for which the, uh, you know, it's applied. So let me go ahead and do some calculations here for you. So basically, 80 kilonewtons um, is the, uh, the load, so that's newtons. And the area is pi over 4. Diameter, remember, is 50 millimeters. You've got to convert that to uh, meters. So this comes out to be minus 40.7, actually, 40.74 megapascal. All right, and then you already know this guy is minus 40.74, so take advantage of that calculation already. And then your moment about x-axis is 3,000. What is C, by the way? C is the distance between the, uh, the neutral axis to point K, and that happens to be the radius of this shaft in this case. So 25 millimeters or 0.025 meters divided by I. I for a circular section is pi over 64 diameter to power 4. So if you do the, uh, the math here, uh, this should come out to be about 203.72 megapascal. You see, this point is under much more stress, point K, because it's affected by the combination of what? Combination of the uh, bending moment and uh, the uh, axial force. So bending is stress and axial is uh, axial is stress. Okay, so that takes care of uh, the um, our sigmas. Let's go ahead and calculate the tau. So let me show you here what happens to the tau. We know that both point H and K are going to be affected exactly the same way due to torsional stress. In fact, maximum we know always happens on the outside. So for example, point H, you will see these uh, the stress, which would be like that, right? Here, you see the look at the direction of the torque. And at point K, the same thing. You have a stress, shear stress like that. And that's the TC over J. But now, we have to ask ourselves, what about the effect of the shear, the, trans, the, the shear load here? So that shear load is going to have an effect. Let me show you a better picture over here. You see how uh, if you had a shear load like that, this shear load V, we know that the shear stress has to be equal to zero here and zero here. And actually, it becomes maximum right here. And look at the direction of the shear. It's pointing that way. So right here, we'll have shear stresses that are maximum right there like that. So we know that that shear stress is equal to VQ over IT, but a simple derivation shows that this maximum shear stress right here is four-thirds of V over A. So you don't have to really go and find Q, the first moment of area, and then use I and so on. So you can bypass that. So we know that, therefore, the shear stress at K due to, you see at this point, K, due to this shear load is zero. So I'm not going to have anything due to that. But take a look at the shear stress at point H. So this shear stress, remember, is uniform everywhere. So that would be the shear stress at point H right here. But look, you also have a shear stress due to the TC over J. So this is the TC over J. This is the VQ over IT or four-third V over A. So the question is, what do you do with that? Since TC over J is much larger, and you see they're going in the opposite direction, we subtract that. OK? So let's go ahead and plug in our numbers. So the torque is 4 kilonewtons. That's 4,000. C again is the, uh, uh, the radius. And J, by the way, is twice I. So it's pi over 32. Uh, 0.05 diameter to power 4 minus 4 third V is this shear load 30 kilonewtons divided by area. There we go. So that's 
So I'm running out of space here. So I say tau sub h comes out to be about 142.6 megapascal. And if you just calculate this guy, tau sub k, in other words, just this term here, 4,000 times 0.025 divided by j, happens to be 162, almost 163. 163 megapascal, roughly. 162.975. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you is actually how these stresses are acting, you know, in terms of the stress element. So let me draw a, maybe a larger picture of this section. So remember, this is point X, uh, this is uh, X axis, sorry, and this is uh, uh, Y axis. And this is, remember, this is point H here. I'll show it like that. And this is point K, right on the Y axis. Okay? So take a look. The stress at H is only due to this normal stress, and that's compressive. So your 40.74 goes right there. Of course, you have one that acting exactly the opposite direction. And um, then we calculated the shear stress at point H. At point H, the shear stress overall is going to be in this direction. So because remember, the TC over J dominates. Once you figure out the direction here on this uh, side, then it has to be in the opposite direction. And then you can figure out on the other four faces. Remember that shear stress has to be equal on all four faces. So this actually happens to be this number that I got here, 142.6. And then for point K, all we have to do is say, okay, at K, we ended up getting a tensile stress of 203.72, uh, which is actually much more stress than point uh, H in terms of uh, normal stresses. And what about the shear stress? You could see actually the direction here is acting like that, which means it's acting like this here and down and up here. And that was about 163 megapascal. So actually, at this section, point K is the one that is uh, more stressed. And of course, the story doesn't end here, as you guys know. We can actually take this uh, stress element and then look at the, uh, the principal stresses, calculate sigma 1 and sigma 2. And maybe that's another video that I'm going to show you and then after you find sigma 1 and sigma 2 and your maximum shear stress, depending on your material properties and the, the character of the material actually, is it a ductile material or is it brittle material, we can go and talk about the failure theories. Maximum uh, you know, uh, energy distortion or one misses and so on. Okay, so I hope this uh, made some of these uh, maybe so-called complicated problems that you think they are complicated, but they are not. Actually, if you just uh, follow certain process and routine of showing the internal forces, you should be in good shape. So I hope that this made, made things clear. Thank you very much, as always, for watching and listening.